The first reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 2 and verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The second reading is taken from Acts 4, verses 32 to 37. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to them, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Good morning, church. It is good to be with you. It's great to be a part of you this morning, uh, having left home at half past seven to travel down. Uh, It's great to be here and to arrive safely, just to spend some time in God's house and to fellowship with one another. I come bearing good news. You will know, or some of you will remember, for three years I spent uh, time in Bible college with Ian. And the good news is that my therapy has now come to an end. And then now declare me as sane mind, which is got to be good news. <laughs> I joke. It's, so, it's great to have spent some special time with Ian and to remain a friend of his uh, all this time. We've been out of college now just over 10 years. Can you believe it? Um, it's been a while. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to continue the ministry and continue to hear the stories of yourselves and Ian as he ministers here it's uh, Westbury. I always get confused when you call it West End Baptist Church and then it's, we're in Westbury and it's Westbury Baptist Church. and you know, We're God's people, aren't we? It doesn't matter. You know. I'm going to invite you to stand with me just for a moment. Please stand. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. gracious and wonderful God. We stand before you this morning and we ask that heaven would be opened and your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us. That in this morning, Lord, we would hear from you. That in this time we would be united in heart and in voice. That as we worship, we recognize we worship not just with all of heaven, but with all of your people, all of the church across this land and across this globe. Father, we thank you for your church, of which Jesus is the head. We thank you, God, that you have given us life, that we would spend this life with you, walking this journey of faith with you. 
And so as we stand before you, Lord, breathe life into us. Renew us. Strengthen us. Encourage us. Bless us. Lord, do your work within us this morning that we would not resist your hand upon us. Lord, I pray this morning that you would break the chains of the devil in Westbury. That this town would be released for your work. That this town would be set free to receive your spirit. To receive the salvation that is Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray this morning that deaf ears will hear. That hardened hearts will soften. That this town would come to know you. Lord, nothing about us, but about you. This morning we stand before you, Lord, and we pray for, for, for this town, that the churches in this town will be united in heart and in voice and in spirit. That as one they would declare your glory and your majesty and your splendor. That, Lord, across this town your name would be declared and the devil would be defeated. And he would have no place in this town because your light shines into every corner, every home, every heart. Lord, we pray. We pray this morning that it would start with us. That we would see the miracles, the miracles before our very eyes. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I'm just going to test your water this morning. I'm not going to show off like Jesus and turn it into wine. That was his gig. That is just water, isn't it, Ivor? If I start to slur my speeches, you'll know that's not just water. <laughs> so we've gone through some difficult years with the pandemic, with COVID. We went into lockdown, as you well know. Did anyone miss it? No, you're all fully aware that we went through a lockdown, through a pandemic, and we're still coming in through the tail end of it. Um, but as a church, we, we had to stop meeting. Wasn't that strange? Sunday morning, you get up and couldn't go to church. How odd did that feel? I felt it very strange. But let me ask you this morning, by way of a show of hands, how many of you this morning here since the pandemic, have invited someone else to church? Three of you, good. You don't count, Amanda. My wife just put her hand up. There's four of you, that's brilliant. So four of you have invited someone to church. It's just fabulous news. You see, the church doesn't grow on its own. We can sit and we can pray about it. We can sit and we can talk about it. We can do all the sitting we like, but folks, you know, if you want this church to grow, if you want those seats to be full, then we need to put our lives into action. James, very much James of the New Testament, talks very much about our faith and action being hand in hand. That together they work for the good of God. That our faith, that in which we believe in Jesus Christ, and our action will draw people unto him. How many of you want to see this church full? Well, that's most of you. How many of you want to see this church full? That's all of you. That's good. I'm going to have to report back to Ian. You know this, don't you? How responsive you are this morning to me. And so I do like a little bit of interaction. But James talks about our faith and our action. You see... What happens if we are not inviting people into church, if we are not drawing people into Christ, what happens to our churches? They close. In my second year at my first church, we went through an extraordinary year in that every single month of that year, and there were a couple of months where we lost more than one, we had a death every single month. And so in that second year of my being there, and it was nothing to do with my ministry, I can guarantee you that. We had lost 15 people. And of a church, roughly on a Sunday morning, of about 30 people, we lost half of our church in one year. 
And so we had to up our game. We had to look at our strategy of what we were going to do to grow the church again. Praise God, the people of that church responded. And when I left, we were touching just shy of 50 people on a Sunday morning. But if we're not inviting folks, they don't come. This, to people out there, is alien land. They don't understand why we come and we stand and we sing and then we listen to someone talk. They don't understand it. They don't get it. So the chance of someone wandering is going to be very small in comparison to an invitation. I wonder if you want to be one of the last six people of this church who has to make that decision to shut those doors for the last time. I never want to be in that place where I have to think about, do I shut these doors? Do I turn this key for the last time? I want to be part of a church that is growing and is vibrant. And I'm sure you do too. And that's why this morning we're going to think about is mission an event or a way of life? Is mission an event or a way of life? I want to tell you this morning that I am a child of Billy Graham. Not that my mother had an extramarital affair and I am the byproduct of that affair. I'm talking spiritually. Spiritually, I am a child of Billy Graham's because it was he who led me to the Lord. It was this man from America who came here on mission to do an event, to do a crusade, who spoke the truth of Jesus into my life that drew me unto Jesus. I'm sure you've heard of Billy Graham. Anyone not heard of Billy Graham this morning? So you're all understanding who Billy Graham was this morning. Fabulous. A man who would travel continents to speak of Jesus. Who would fill Wembley Stadium and speak of his saviour. And declare the sovereignty of Jesus over this land. He was a man of truth. A man of integrity. That's exactly how I feel. But I'll keep going. That's not a problem. <laughs> That's just floor me. That is. But, he, but he was a man who just kept going for Jesus, who would keep on soldiering and would declare the greatness of God's kingdom. And people by their thousands, by their millions would come to salvation. It was a wonderful, wonderful man. And because of his witness, because of his work, I myself found Jesus. My wife Amanda works for CFAN, which is Christ for All Nations. Um, founded by Ryan, she's going to give me a look now when I get this wrong. You know that wife look you get blokes when, when things are not right? Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Ryan Hardbonke was the evangelist who founded Christ for All Nations. He's now been taken over by Daniel Kalender, uh, another evangelist. And they travel the world predominantly into Africa. And they will do crusades and they will do evangelism and they will bring millions of millions of people to Jesus. Very, very similar to what uh, Billy Graham used to do. And so through the work, we've seen salvation. They, they will do some events here in this country too. So if you ever hear of CFAN, Christ for All Nations, Amanda is the person who's running the show in charge and she is the one who holds it all together. That's what she likes to think anyway. I didn't say that out loud, all right. But CFAN go out into the world and they declare Jesus and bring people to faith. After all, Jesus said, didn't he, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. But that scares the pants of us. Why does it scare the pants of us? Because we think we've got to understand what Scripture says from beginning to end. We've got to understand God's thinking, God's heart. We've got to know the Holy Spirit personally. We've got to understand who Jesus was. Let me tell you this morning, no, you don't. All you need to know is that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and then you share your personal story, your testimony with other people. You don't need to be a theologian this morning to go and share the gospel news with Westbury. 
You simply live your life in a way that declares Jesus. In Acts 2, Peter went out and he spoke to the crowds. And he spoke in such a way that the crowds heard and the crowd responded. This is what Billy Graham used to do. This is what uh, Reinhard Bonnke and uh, Daniel Kalender would do. And Peter spoke in such a way that in one single day, 3,000 people came to the Lord. Can you imagine an event in Westbury where 3,000 people come to Jesus? Are there enough chairs in the churches in Westbury to house 3,000 people? Wouldn't it be fabulous though? Wouldn't it be awesome to know that 3,000 people in one single day came to the Lord? Say, yes, Matt. Go on, say, yes, Matt. <laughs> it's all right, you can speak. It's, it's okay. But you know, we look, don't we, sometimes as churches, as Christians, to an event. Maybe to something in the local park, something in the town, something in the school. And we put an event on, we put an outreach event on, and we go out and we speak of Jesus. And we plan our time and our energies into a whole time scale. We spend our year leading up to it, the excitement building. In my first church, we would do a um, party in the park every year. Party in the park, so I took £50. I gave five groups £10 each. And I said to them, go and multiply that £10, and with that multiplication, whatever it amounts to, we're going to do something in the park for the community. Now, it depends on how much you raise on how good this is going to be. And with £50, £10 each, five groups the first year raised just under £700. We had bouncy castles, we had ice cream vans, we had burger bars, we had a carnival stores. We even had a Christian band to come and play music in the background. And so we did that for one whole Saturday. The following year we, we repeated the exercise and that year they raised just over £900 from £50. And from that we did a better, greater even party in the park event. And we put it on free so when people from the town were coming in and saying, oh, how much does it cost? What do we pay for? It's free. It's free. Just go. Enjoy. How many places do you go to today for something free? There's nowhere, is there? Everything costs money. And the people of the town couldn't understand why we were doing this for free. We all had our uh, church badges on, so we bought a load of badges. So, for example, here... West End Baptist Church, we're wearing a badge. Well, what's the badge for? What church is that? And so it opened up conversation for the people in the town to say, we're a church, we're believers in Jesus, and we want to bless you with a free event. They couldn't get their heads around it. But sadly, some churches don't do anything because they think it's down to the evangelist. It's down to the minister, it's down to the pastor, it's down to the leadership to grow the church. Well, I want to tell you this morning that it's not just Ian's job to grow this church. We are all responsible for growing God's church here in Westbury. We all, all have a part to play in growing God's kingdom here. And so mission can be an event, it can be a one-off, it can be an evangelist in the town, in the streets, whatever. But mission can also be a way of life. It's great that you don't have a clock, I can preach forever. Oh, it's up there, I can see it now, now I've looked. I can't preach forever, I'm gutted. I really believe in this way of living. That mission is a way of life. That every morning we wake up and we say, God, use me today. God, take me and use me for your glory. Whether I'm in the post office, whether I'm in the school, whether I'm in the supermarket, whether I'm driving down the road, God, use me for your glory today. 
we were sat in some traffic lights. And we were the second car in. And the traffic lights changed to green. And the voice in the back said, Come on, you muppet, get a move on. I didn't need to look left to know that my wife, Amanda, was glaring at me as she spoke the words, I wonder where he's heard that from. My three-year-old, bless him, had picked up what his dad would say as he was driving, and I admit it's not a Christian way to drive. So even in our driving, even in our every day, we have to remember we belong to Jesus. And so we are being used by God in every special way. We intentionally look to demonstrate God's love to this town. How many times has someone made a promise to you and broken it? Yeah, more than one occasion. Our words are cheap. I really believe, Amanda will tell you, I really believe that actions speak louder than words. And so when we are out in town, whenever we are around our neighbours, our friends, our family, instead of just speaking of Jesus, we actually demonstrate him. D- demonstrate his love, demonstrate his compassion, demonstrate who he is and what he's about. Let me give you an example. I was in the supermarket, this was pre-pandemic, and the lady in front of me had put her groceries through the till, and she was about to pay. I said, hang on, my love. She looked at me. I said to the lady, hang on, let me pay for those. And this lady looked at me and says, you are. I said, I'm going to bless you. I want to pay for your shopping. When I got home and told Amanda, she went pale and had to sit down because she was imagining a whole trolley load of shopping. I said, don't worry, love. It was only a basket full. But you know what? This lady went away in tears because I demonstrated the love of Jesus to her. They are simple, but they are effective. They are powerful ways of demonstrating the love of Jesus. How else do we do mission together? Well, we've read it this morning. We devote ourselves to being together. That every day we come together that every day we share space and time together. The reading says they had everything in common. Just look around the room. Do you have everything in common this morning? Is there someone in this room this morning who you don't know something about? When we left our first church, we planted a brand new church. And we were intentional of living together as church, not in the same home, but as church, we would gather regularly. And at least once a month, this is again pre-pandemic, at least once a month, we would go out for the day. And we would spend a Saturday either at a National Trust property, at a museum in the local park. We might go for a pub meal together, but we would be intentional in spending time together. Wednesday night was our time when we would, yes, go down the local pub. We'd have a meal in the local pub and we'd spend time just being together. Or we'd go into a costa and spend time together just having a coffee. But our church plans was very much about how do we live life as a church. I believe that church should be family. And I spend an awful lot of time with my family, both my church family and my physical family. And so this year we've taken our church plant and we've joined what I call my old church. So growing up, the church I was in, we've gone back to that church. They had gone down to seven people. And they had said to us last year, do you know what, Matt? We need some help. We're going to close. Would you help us? Would you support us? Can you do something? And so we took a decision, decision this February to take our church plant and go and be with my old church. And what we do now every day, every weekday, Monday to Friday, half three till five, we open the church up and we call it Cupper and Cake. 
Who doesn't like cuppa and cake? Anybody here who doesn't like a cuppa and a piece of cake? I was going you must be one on the planet who does not like cake. <laughs> and so all we do is we open the doors, we put a sign out saying, Cuppa and cake, free, come join us. And people come. We have a consistent 11 or 12 children who come every single day just to spend time with us eating cake and drinking squash in their case. But we're able to have a relationship with them. We relate, we're able to relate to where they're at with school. We're able to relate with the adults where they are with life. But just being together simply for an hour and a half. You don't, not everyone comes every day for every hour and a half. That's just me because I like cake. But people will come and dot in and go again. People will come every other day. But it is about being relational, about being missional. And the estate in which we are based is now seeing that the church is alive. And the church means business because we are missional together every single day. One of my other roles that I've now um, taken on, I'm chaplain to the NHS, excuse me. So I'm a chaplain in seven GP surgeries uh, local to us. And it opens up doors to be able to speak with people um, about their problems, about their difficulties, about some of the issues they face. But also it gives me opportunity to share my faith with them. And one particular patient uh, last year, beginning of last year, came to me. And I kid you not, so every appointment I have is 45 minutes long. So people are able just to sit and talk and share their problems. And so Deb came to me, and for 50 minutes, I kid you not, for 50 minutes, she did not stop for breath. Da -da 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 this problem, that problem, this issue, this, that issue, this difficulty, that difficulty, this problem with the family, that problem with the family, this going on, that going on, this going on. How do I cope? Can't cope. This is happening. That's going on. This and that. And she went on, and I kid you not, for 50 minutes, she just poured her heart out. She was a broken She was a broken lady. And at the end of the 50 minutes, I was just about to say to her, Deb, I'm sorry, but I need you to stop. And she turned to me and says, Matt, I want to tell you something else. And she was angry. For the whole of my life, she was 58 at the time. The whole of my life, I've always wanted to be baptized. And who the hell do I speak to about being baptized? And she was wagging her finger like this at me. I said, Deb, stop. What? Deb? My other role in life, the other job that I do, I'm a Baptist minister. And if you want to be baptized, I will baptize you. She broke down. And she was in floods of tears. And she was inconsolable. And do you know what I did last, last November? I baptized her. She came to Jesus. She gave her life to the Lord. And the peace that came over her was phenomenal. I can't describe to you, I can't put into words how she changed in an instant. The moment she said, I receive you, Jesus, into my life. The peace that came over her. And she just sat in the room, just still. Just nothing. Nothing came out of her mouth. She was at peace. And we baptized her. And she's walking with the Lord. Purely because of missional living. Where I had an opportunity to share something of my faith. I didn't go into the depths of Scripture. I didn't go into the detail of what the New Testament is compared to the Old Testament. I didn't share about the Holy Spirit and the work of God. I simply told her my story. And how God has touched my life. I showed her something of the love of Jesus in that moment. And this is what we do every afternoon when people walk through our church doors. We are compassionate. We are loving. We are receptive to these people. 
And this is a new venture for us. But we pray that one day it will bear fruit. Missional living, everyday missional living is a non-hypocritical way of living because you can't, because you've got to be real to the people with Jesus. See, when we come here on a Sunday, we can come and be Christians, but then Monday to Saturday, we can be who we want to be because we're out of sight of our brothers and sisters. But when we are missional living every single day, it keeps us in check of who we are and who we belong to. There's a story in John 4 of a lady, a Samaritan lady, who is touched by Jesus. And this is the result, not only of her being touched by Jesus, but what she does in sharing her story. This is John chapter 4 and verse 39. It says, many of those Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You see, we tell our story. And we allow room for Jesus to come in. See, it's not all about us. We don't take over the whole room, but we tell our story and we allow Jesus to come in. That people will encounter our Lord. That they too will encounter him in the way that we have. That Jesus will do his work. That they would receive him, not us. The Samaritan lady told her story and Jesus came in. And what happened? Many more people came to the Lord. It's there, folks. Peter told the story. Thousands came to the Lord. The Samaritan lady told her story. Many more came to the Lord. What's your story? What is your story this morning? Who are you sharing your story with? How many are you inviting, drawing unto Jesus? It might seem daunting this morning, but you know what? When you walk out those doors, God goes with you. God will walk with you on the journey of life, so allow him to take you, allow him to speak through you. That wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whoever you are with, you are demonstrating and speaking the love and the compassion and the power and the authority of Jesus across this town. Let us pray together that there will be transformation in our day. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we long to see revival in our town. Lord, we long to see your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, we long to see your hand at work. And so we pray this morning, Lord, you'll give us the tools. You'll give us the opportunity. You'll give us the ability, Lord, to walk your walk. That through our lives and through our witness, Lord, many more would come to you. Lord, we surrender to you. Our King and our Savior, our Shepherd, our Friend, our Brother, our Teacher, our Redeemer, That, Lord, from this morning, this church would be filled with your glory, with your praise, with people who want to serve you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.